Buenas, buenas tardes, vamos a comenzar la, ses la sesión de la tarde con Jenna Graham y vamos a, a, a con ella, nos vamos a entrar en, bueno, en, en políticas de lo, de lo contemporáneo y algo que también veremos después con la mesa redonda moderada por Jordi Solé. ¿no? Jenna Graham es una eh, educadora, e investigadora y activista que ha trabajado en, bueno, forma parte de, de, del colectivo Ultrared y que ha desarrollado un trabajo, en mi opinión, muy interesante en las distintas instituciones culturales por las que ha pasado, hackeándolas de alguna manera o haciendo un trabajo de, de hacker dentro de, de, de la institución. Así, así pasó en Serpentine Galleries, ¿no? con el proyecto eh, Center for, for Possible Studies, ¿no? Y, y, ta, y también ahora, después, en Nottingham Contemporary, ¿no? donde estuvo un par, un par de años, ¿no? Two years sí, o sí. la edad, y, y ahora, está, ahora está en Goldsmith. Para nosotros es una muy grata, muy grata presencia de Jenna aquí. Llevábamos intentando un tiempo que viniese, o el poco tiempo que llevo ya aquí, es, había intentado que viniese al, al programa de estudios y nos eh, hace muy felices que esté aquí. Hoy nos va a presentar una... una conferencia que se llama Técnicas para vivir de otro modo, lecciones de vida del poscapitalismo en los archivos de la educación emancipatoria. Y de alguna manera nos va a servir para cerrar parte de lo de esto, no para cerrar, pero no hay nada que cerrar, ¿no? pero para establecer un puente entre lo que pasaba esta mañana y lo que va a pasar después, ¿no? esta, esta mesa redonda en la que vamos a hablar de cuestiones políticas de la hora y de la educación como práctica política en el ahora en Cataluña y en el Estado español. Bueno, gracias. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Um... Yes, thank you so much for having me um, and um, for the invitation and to the other speakers who I've really enjoyed hearing this morning and early this afternoon. Um, I also wanted to say, uh, to apologize, I suppose, to say um, I'm sorry I'm not speaking in Spanish or in Castellano or in Catalan. Uh, and indeed will be speaking in the language of my mother and also the neo-colonial forces of the present, English. And um, I hope that you'll bear with me. I'll go slowly and I know some of you will have translation. So I wanted to talk today um, and use this term techniques for living otherwise. And um, this, this kind of term comes from um, the pedagogical genealogy of the Ecole Moderne movement or the Frenet movement in France, uh, which was active in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and it's one of the genealogies I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to go in depth into these histories of emancipatory education. I rather thought to talk about a few um, in relation to the kinds of um, strategies, I suppose, and um, modes of being that they uh, provoke. So the Frenet movement um, was a kind of cooperative network of teachers and students, um, which brought together different techniques around the production of emancipatory pedagogy in schools, um, but sort of differed from progressive educators on the one hand and the communist party of France on the other, of which they were members, um, by combining these questions of technique with those of um, collective production of emancipatory life conditions, so changing life conditions. Um, and I wanted to look precisely at this conjunction between the technique or the tools of radical pedagogy or emancipatory pedagogy and this um, direct changes in life conditions. Um, and this is in, in particularly into the production and the reproduction of life. And this is... Um, This was important to me because in my experience of a lot of discussions of emancipatory education in cultural institutions, and we heard earlier today of this educational turn, in this educational turn, it seems to me that it is often, there's often an over-interest in techniques and histories and less of an emphasis on changing life conditions. That is the life conditions of the rooms that we are gathered in. Cultural institutions in their current state, and I'm speaking specifically in the Anglophone world that I'm a part of, not here, which we could debate or discuss later. But cultural institutions in their current state are often guilty of outright neglect of life conditions, privileging discussions of emancipatory education and political theory over long and labored work of addressing their own precarious and sometimes violent conditions, including underpayment or non-payment of workers, outsourcing, providing precarious zero-hour contracts, rarely addressing differences in capacity, and the presence of re and realities of reproductive labor. 
So my experiences are, as I said, largely based in the English speaking world. So it's in the Q&A, maybe we can talk about whether this thing is happening here also, where the, the discussions around emancipatory pedagogy don't often actually resonate in the buildings in which they take place or with the buildings, with the, with the workers in which, um, in which they're taking place. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which we can talk about. But my experience is that um, these kinds of conditions of life, of reproduction of life, of social reproduction in institutions I've worked in are often shunned, literally relegated to the dustbins in order that the worrying of political themes and discussions can take place unfettered by the pesky details of life that might interfere with them. This emphasis on the spectacular over conditions of life, of creating spaces of discussion and debate over practices of change in institutions are symptomatic with what Callan Crouch describes as the context of post-democracy in which we inhabit shells of former institutions of the public sphere with little eff efficacy or emphasis on changing our lives or the places in which we gather. Um, so I'm reading these genealogies of emancipatory education in terms of the question of social reproduction, and that is the reproduction of social life from a situation in which life is routinely ignored in the very halls in which we assemble to discuss its most urgent issues. And I wanted to talk about these three techniques for living otherwise um, that emerge in genealogies of radical education that I've been engaging with over a number of years. The first is the practice or technique of naming, which sounds rather simplistic, but I'll go into some, some detail about um, in radical or emancipatory pedagogy practices, um, a number of them, the, the question of naming is something that takes actually qu is quite a, a labor and um, is quite a sophisticated series of technologies for thinking about how we define and work together on problems. The second is around uh, questions of composition or composing, how we, um, how we arrange the spaces in which we gather to um, adopt and sort of deal with the complexities of life that surround us and that shape those encounters. And the third is looking at questions of instituting or making new infrastructures of the possible. So creating, um, uh, linking emancipatory pedagogy strategies to the production of new life worlds through social movements, through their engagements and direct um, emphasis on social movement. Um, and I guess I, I, I'm coming from this work from a lot of collective things, a lot of collective processes. So. As uh, we heard this morning of the woman who didn't feel comfortable claiming the space um, of her work as her own and rather thought more about um, the collective in which she's a part of, I have the same feeling and I always feel quite strange being the only one at the front of the room given that they're all in my head and <laughs> all of these people that I've worked with. Um, but also having been involved in something that you saw in Micro Cillon's presentation, the production of this radical education workbook. And um, I wanted to share this with you because this, with this workbook, which was collectively created by a group of radical teachers um, and students in London during the moment of um, 2009 and 2010, which was when we were fighting against new austerity me measures in education in the United Kingdom. And we produced this book um, to a large extent to try, as part of our um, engagement with spaces, occupations, um, spaces in which students and teachers were gathering to rethink education, both in terms of fighting the fees um, that were being introduced um, and the privatization processes, but also in terms of thinking about what kind of pedagogy are we fighting for in the universities and in the schools. And the Radical Education Workbook was um, a book, but also a process of teachers and students kind of coming together, looking at historical genealogies of radical education and um, engaging with them in terms of their relevance to our current kind of situation in the politics of education. And this was a very, I would say, a feminist kind of practice, pedagogical practice to on the one hand, and this is the structure of the workbook, to um, have a little blurb about the history of a particular pedagogical strategy, to then um, try something together, so to actually engage our bodies in the processes and the techniques that are discussed, and then to situate it um, that pedagogy within the context of the present. So we created this workbook, and when you read the workbook, you can see these different kinds of um, moti modes through which we were trying to write together. Um, and so this is, um, yeah, very important kind of backdrop to the discussions that I'll be sort of putting out there today. And so we looked at a number of different histories um, that I'll describe 
And I think also it was really, um, I think uh, Miklo Silion talked about that project as an ultra red project, which is a sound and political art collective that I am a part of, but it was ultra red with a group called the Radical Education Forum. And I, so I should emphasize it wasn't an art project per se, it was a project that was actually instigated by teachers and students interested in changing the role and the, the pra political practice of education. Um, and ultra red as a group of artists, as, we as well as activists involved in education, education politics uh, worked in collaboration to help to shape that document. Um, and so first, maybe we talk a little bit about naming. Um, and naming as a practice, um, I think we, we heard a lot about Paulo Freire today. Um, and, um, and somebody was asking about like, you know, some of the whether there's relevance and sort of thinking through the strategies of Freire and pedagogy of the oppressed, given the circumstances of the present and the locations in which we often speak about pedagogy of the oppressed being significantly different. But one of the things that I, I find tremendously useful, not only in Freire, but in the, in the networks of, um, of educators that took up the pedagogy of the oppressed, and I'll largely be reading I'll largely be more referring to those kinds of groups that took up pedagogy of the oppressed in collective practices, not so much about the master's own kind of ideas, but, but how the groups then took up and created kind of very practicable workbooks in a number of different social movements, drawing from pedagogy of the oppressed, but also other kinds of um, pedagogy. So these workbooks we're looking at now are from the Alfor Al Alforja Network, which was a network across uh, the Americas, really, that was set up in the 80s and drew from various experiences with um, radical literacy and pedagogy of the oppressed in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, in, Dif in, Bra in Brazil, and then also in North America, how that got translated into popular education practices in the civil rights movement. And within um, those practices, the kind of notion or the question of naming, it comes up again and again. And this is this question of naming, I think, is particularly useful in our neoliberal kind of moment, which is where um, problems are often, or the idea of the problem, of the issue that we work on, is often one that's assumed or taken for granted or decided by people who are quite far away from the actual experience of the problem. The problem as a, as a thing, like the problem in radical pedagogy has been in circulation for many, many years. John Dewey, for example, wrote a really important text in 19, I think 17 or something like that, that was um, called The People and Their Problems. And where he looks at like the notion of, um, he talks about democracy as less a par parliamentary structure and more uh, a structure of, of people coming together to work on their problems in the situations in which they find themselves. And so um, in, in some ways, um, Freire's movement from the banking concept of education to problem posing education echoes that earlier work of Dewey and comes up again and again, um, like how do you name the problem? And in Freire, this is elaborate. You know, this process goes on for chapters and chapters of sort of um, how do we go through processes of sort of um, first identifying uh, an issue, and then how do we then visually represent that issue? How do we then unpack our visual representation of that issue? How do we then um, work that into a series of um, other kinds of um, practices through which we refine the problem, like we historically situate it? We, we situate ourselves in relation to the problem. That comes up a lot in these workbooks, and um, there's one particular kind of strand within um, within the use of popular education or, or um, pedagogy of the oppressed in in the Americas, which was called um, naming the moment. And this is um, this draws both from Freire's work, but also from Gramsci's Antonio Gramsci's conjunctural analysis. So of like looking at the conjuncture of a historical moment in time. And in these workbooks, you see that the naming process, um, and this is not something that's as emphasized in Freire, but it, it's there, is um, at the one time sort of analyzing the historical condition of the problem. So today we're, you know, experiencing the problem um, whereby cultural institutions don't really deal with the issues that they like to talk about. So that's our problem in the room. Um, so they deal with the problem. They say, well, historically, how did that come about? We develop a timeline. We might sort of um, uh, work together to try and construct how this moment came to be. We might use a tool like this, which was developed within uh, by the Alforja network, which looks at sort of how do we analyze the root problems, the infrastructures, the mesostructures, the political aspects of the problem, and the ideological aspects. So how do we look at the problem from multiple different perspectives? 
but a whole other set of practices exist within the, these workbooks, which are about um, situating the problem within the relations of a group. And so Paolo, Paolo Frari's uh, interrogation of the relationship between the teacher and the student here is not only about the context of education, it's about implicating the people in the room and the set of relations that are in the room in, that, in the naming process. So the people in the room are naming a problem that isn't far away from them and that sits that is sitting in the room with them. And it is embodied in their relationships, in the micropolitics of their relationships with one another and the practices that they use to organize themselves. This is incredibly useful in a context of neoliberalism where this kind of double talk scenario is very prevalent where we speak and often don't engage in actions that have any correspondence to the kinds of uh, passionate or politicized kind of speech that we're engaged with. Um, and this, this separation kind of gets greater and greater. And I suppose um, one of the practices I wanted in each of these circumstances when I'm looking at a radical pedagogy history also embed this in a, in a contemporary practice and something um, that I've been involved in where we've used this kind of context. And for example, the context of naming um, was something that was very important for us in, um, in a theater project that I was involved with, which was part of the Center for Possible Studies, which um, Pablo mentioned which was a, an eight year, six to eight year project in a neighborhood where we worked in alliance with various groups and we meaning um, a group of artists and cultural workers, some of whom were employed by the Serpentine Gallery and some of whom were not, um, but also really intensively with neighborhood groups and particularly activist groups who were responding to the context of both gentrification, aggressive gentrification in their neighborhood, but also migration policing, which have a very incredible intersection in the United Kingdom right now, which um, is really very uh, violent process. Um, so this theater group was um, brought together to sort of interrogate the relationship between um, precarious cultural workers and precarious migrant workers in the kind of basic terms. And this was because um, we were kind of perturbed by the, the kind of notion of um, that comes up a lot in, in sort of the, the work in the United Kingdom of socially engaged work, which is that it often adopts a charity model in which there are people to be helped and problems that are predefined. Um, rather felt that cultural workers were not there to solve problems and were not really in a position to because they were, as they were in many cases, very precarious themselves and that there hadn't been a, a conversation about the possible solidarities between the precarious working conditions of cultural workers and those of migrant workers, which are very different from one another, not the same, but, um, but working within precarious conditions. And um, implicated theater was... Um, uh, worked in on the one level in relation to labor struggles, um, so worked very directly in campaigns like um, the campaign around domestic workers in the UK um, support uh, uh, sort of against um, migration policies that made them increasingly pre precarious, um, but also um, hotel workers, um, other kinds of people who are working in hotels. We we did a a lot of theater work, which was in alliance with people who were being raided on a regular basis. So the, the UK um, border agency was going out and sort of raiding groups um, in cultural settings like Latin American dance clubs. Um, and so we were, we were developing sort of very concrete strategies for how you might deal with those situations using pedagogy of the oppressed and theater of the oppressed. Um, but at the same time, and increasingly the question of uh, the context in which we were doing this project, which was a, an art gallery, um, which caters to very a number of the same people who are the ones who run the hotels and who have domestic workers, um, and that that we weren't addressing that 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 kind of fundamental contradiction. So using kind of naming the moment strategies of sort of like going deeper and deeper and deeper into a problem, um, and using theater of the oppressed, we started to interrogate the relationship between the group and the gallery that was hosting us and paying for the project. And um, so we created a piece, a theater piece that was called the Embassy Ball, where um, the migrant workers in the group um, sort of created a, an intervention into a, um, an art opening where they kind of threw, the, um, threw their trays down and started staging discussions with people about um, the various kinds of con uh, precarious conditions that the arts are actually enabling to a certain extent. 
Um, and we, we did this uh, work and, and inevitably started to think more and more about our own relations in the group and started to interrogate the way the budget was organized, for example, in the group. Like, why was it that the participants in the project weren't being paid and the artists were? Why were, um, you know, in all of these kind of conventions of participatory arts projects that um, sort of are taken for granted a lot of the time. So we started to develop open budgeting processes where um, we thought through how would we reorganize the budget, how would we collectively think about how to reorganize the budget. Um, but also, how would we accommodate the fact that um, the, the conditions of life were increasingly important and more important than our ability to produce kind of spectacles and theater pieces? So people in our group were being dehoused uh, very quickly. They were not able to eat in some cases, you know, that we had to actually shift the budget to um, cope with living conditions um, on a very basic level. So we had to have a solidarity fund, take money out of production budgets so that we had a solidarity fund to pay for housing in an emergency situation. And those were all kind of very um, intensive sort of um, collective negotiations. And um, because of the precarious nature of the group, it wasn't able to sort of sustain itself in that particular mode for, for much more than a year. Um, but that kind of process um, also provoked many kind of questions around um, how we would sort of do this within the context of a gallery and, you know, sort of um, put into relief some of the problems with doing this kind of work and doing pedagogy of the oppressed or theater of the oppressed within the context of mainstream cultural institutions, um, though not in, a, in such a way that we wanted to stop. And there's still a number of projects that are taking place in this vein um, uh, in, in the gallery. I'm not there anymore. But so the second, um, I guess the second area I wanted to look at was thinking about um, composing or composition. And, um, and this, if, if in, in the sort of naming process, one of the really important things that is taking place is a, a linking of the macro, the sort of macro political context and the micro, the sort of everyday lived, um, sensed kind of realities that are shaping the way that we relate to each other. And if that kind of conjunction between the macro and the micro is something that pe um, popular education processes actually give us the tools to deal with, um, then, then they sort of lend themselves to questions of, of composition, of what people and agencies are assembled in the processes of emancipatory education. Um, and um, composition is a term that's used by the Argentinian, some of you might know, the Argentinian collective, um, Colectivo Situaciones, who have written, I think, incredibly, uh, in a very contemporary and interesting way with the, with the histories of, of pedagogy of the oppressed in particular. Um, and situated them in contemporary kind of activist context. And they say where Freire uh, and, and other practitioners of pedagogy of the oppressed often emphasize communication, that what's happening is dialogue and communication. They say actually it's much more akin to um, composition because it actually deals with this element of the micro and the bodily and the, the modes of inhabitation that we develop together. And one, um, another sort of genealogy that I think works through this in a really interesting way is um, that of the, of the Ecole Moderne movement, which I described in the beginning. And um, the Ecole Moderne movement was instigated by Elise and Celestine Frenet in France. It's often called the Frenet movement, and it's often only described in relation to Celestine Frenet, which is a kind of you know, ongoing issue within that we've heard a number of times today of like the erasure of um, women who are involved in these processes. Um, she didn't write as many books as he did, but she was certainly involved in the shaping and formation of sort of every aspect and did write books as well and, and papers. Um, anyway, the Frenets in France um, were uh, developed this kind of network of, of teachers um, and uh, it began as what was called the Secular Education Cooperative, which was a cooperative union for educators, which they developed in the 1920s. And the first modern schools were set up in publicly funded primary schools in rural areas. And this is kind of important in terms of like, say, the legacies of other progressive primary school education projects like Summerhill in the UK, which were which are really talked about a lot, but were private. And um, and the fact that this was taking place within publicly funded kind of rural areas, I think, is really important. But one of the main kind of principles or activities within um, the Fene schools, um, how many people are familiar with the Fene history? couple so I'll maybe just I'll go through it yeah <laughs> so um so they th at the sort of center of every school was a printing press 
And um, they were really interested in the printing press in the school, not only to just produce pamphlets and newspapers, which they did. And um, it was a really significant um, mode of production of literacy because students would come into the classroom. They would do something that was called uh, free text, which was sort of like talking or writing if they knew how to write about whatever was on their mind. And this has been developed even more recently into a practice called quad neuf, like you walk in the room and you say, what's up? You know? and, and you sort of write texts about what's coming up in the room. And then you start to um, analyze those texts. Those texts create a vocabulary of terms. You start to create uh, work with those terms. Um, and those, and the, the working with those terms becomes the curriculum, becomes the sort of textbook for the classroom. Um, and these, these um, textbooks are, um, are called life books. Um, so they're about sort of the production of life as much as the production of language. And there's this kind of conjunction in the Frenet movement between these things, between the conjunction, uh, between life and between the machine and the production of these outcomes, these visual and um, text-based outcomes. These are pictures of children working on the printing press. Um, and they would also obviously have to create illustrations, they'd have to create narrations, but they would also, and very importantly, have to create councils through which they would make collective decisions about what would go into the, into the newspaper. And this um, is, uh, this kind of this is sometimes when people talk about the Frenet movement, they get really excited about the machine, and they think it's all about the machine and the machine in the classroom, and they don't really talk about the fact that the machine was like an instigator for the Frenets of these kind of collective decision-making processes. So there were school councils around um, around the um, printing press, but there were also school councils around things like developing agricultural work, um, developing. Um, uh, culinary kinds of collectives. So, so the printing press and the sort of um, process it instigated was then replicated into all different aspects of life in the school. And the school was then a kind of production of life that was um, trying to be also very porous with its, with its neighboring community. So the newspapers that were produced were in the community, but they were also circulated through a very large network to other um, schools all over France and, and later other parts of Europe. Um, but also it's really interesting to think about like where, how reproductive labor fits into this because the text-based side of it is really um, important, of course, and it is the analysis and narration of um, students' lives that was taking place. But the Frenets and Celestine in particular met uh, Krupskaya, Nadia Krupskaya, who was the uh, Lenin's partner <laughs> in in Russia um, and was the, the first deputy minister after the revolution. Um, and she was very involved in that period in conceptualizing what a post-capitalist school would look like. Again, she's written 12 volumes on education, and I think one of them has been translated into English. Um, so, you know, you can see, again, that kind of erasure. But um, she, she was really interested in, um, in reproductive labor and what reproductive labor actually brought into the school context. And uh, so in this, this text, she said um, there was a question that had come to her, should women's work be taught to boys? And she says, uh, just as girls, boys too must be taught how to sew, knit, and mend clothes. In a word, they should be taught to do everything which is in indispensable in life. Children should be assigned without dividing tasks between boys and girls to take turns in preparing school breakfast, washing dishes, and preparing rooms. And for, um, for Krupskaya, that wasn't like a sort of punishment or something like that. That was, she actually felt that people working... Um, on these working on reproductive issues in the school, as did the Frenets, was the source of um, what they called a life force or a spirit. That there was like a spirit that working on one's life conditions in the context of education actually was what would produce the kind of spirit of the school. Um, and um, and this was you know I think really important because they, it was a creative act in the way that they kind of imagined it, not the sort of drudgery kind of idea or the idea of the the work that one that has to do has to be done but should be made invisible. So you know, I think uh, reading like maybe slightly against not against the grain, but reading into it, there's a kind of feminist agenda in some ways within these kinds of practices, even if there was also quite a lot of um, uh, patriarchal agendas and, and misogyny taking place at the same time. Um, so yeah, so these so these multiple production workshops. They, this was also um, the Frenets were also very interested in the Makarenko, who was also involved in the post-revolutionary uh, Soviet experimentation around education. 
um, similar kinds of experiences where um, it was very important to link sort of intellectual production to reproductive labor and to sort of create context in which students were thinking about those things in parallel. There's lots of issues with the Makarenko in terms of authoritarian, you know, uh, punishment systems, which were apparently collectively decided. So I wouldn't like say that all of it was very uh, so utopian, but but I think this this element of sort of combining the analytic and the intellectual with the reproductive was was um, also really consistent in Makarenko's work. And again, um, you know, to come back to a contemporary example, um, I'm just thinking about a project that um, that Ultra Red was involved in many years ago now, in 2007, so a decade ago. Um, and again, working on issues to do with um, migration, but particularly um, we were working in rural areas in the southwest of England where racism is uh, has been on the rise for an incidence, direct inst incidence of um, of uh, racist violence have been on the rise for more than a decade now. Um, and sort of predated Brexit, <laughs> and some of us weren't so surprised by that result as a result of doing this kind of work. That um, and so we developed a project where we were working with sound um, and processes of listening, and um, bringing people together to listen to um, each other's kinds of experiences around racism in the region. And we developed, it was called Dub Grammar, we developed a kind of, um, using very similar techniques to both Frere and Frené, sort of mashing little bits together, we developed a, a kind of um, a grammar or a set of vocabulary of terms that were based in people's experiences of racism. And these terms really um, were at a serious disjuncture with the terms of official racism in the UK. So terms like diversity, which are used to sort of cover over the sort of everydayness and the violence violence actually of racist um, encounters. So we uh, we sort of challenged those and, and the groups that we worked with who were part of a, a charity who supported people with race um, who had experienced racism. So we were working together um, over over a number of years actually in sort of doing these kind of listening sessions within rural, small rural areas and listening and um, responding. And through that work, again, um, there were a number of issues that came to the fore, again, very much related to sort of the reproduction of life conditions, how, um, how intricately related issues like childcare and domestic abuse were with the kind of racism of the, of the criminal justice system, for example. And so these kinds of issues came up again and again, and, and through the listening, a number of things took place. Um, one was to change the, um, relationship of the people who were involved in this process to the charity, which had kind of over the years taken for granted that their position was one of victimhood and that their um, voices should be used to tell the stories of their victimhood. And rather started to, um, the group started to challenge that as a, as a paradigm for their involvement with the organization and started to suggest that they should be more directly involved in the management. Because they had managed these terms and the production of new terms, they were then going to become the sort of cooperative managers of their own kind of organization. And the other issue that came up, as with the implicated theater example, was just the, the question of, um, uh, of solidarity campaigns, of producing networks that were about support um, on all levels, on the level of childcare as much as on the level of um, an emergency response situation if, um, if somebody had had an experience or an, emer an emergency response team. But also the gallery that we were working with, which was called Plymouth Arts Center at the time, also was asked to play a very different role than one of hosting a participatory arts or um, project. They were asked by participants if the space could be used on a regular basis um, by their determination for emergency meetings, for as a shelter, um, at, for various kinds of activities. And, and some of those demands were met and, um, and the gallery became sort of a space on the circuit of support within at least one of the communities um, involved. So, you know, like I'm, I'm just trying to sort of go back again to this, um, so this kind of idea of collective composition also having a direct link to the sort of recomposition of life conditions. Um, and I think I'll just do this final bit, because um, uh, I'm not going to take, I don't think, the full hour, which is um, 
the question of instituting, and I'm not sure if this is the right word. There's lots of words we could use for these things, and the words are very important, and um, and so I'm I'm using them a bit more flippantly than I would like to. But um, but instituting um, in this case is sort of thinking about um, making kind of infrastructures as possible. And I wanted to somehow, I guess, differentiate some of these pedagogical strategies from other progressive or critical pedagogy processes, because each of them is deeply involved in kind of the production of social movements and um, not separated from from that. So, um, and that's something really interesting to think about in terms of the art context and the arts context kind of interest in emancipatory pedagogy and to what extent that can be or is linked to sort of social movements or whether it's isolated within the art space um, and sort of cut off from those movements that are also kind of considering these same questions. And um, I, um, this is kind of newer research and not in the radical education workbook, but um, uh, I've been looking back on sort of some things that were important in, in my own formation in North America in, uh, within the popular education kind of context and um, looking at different kind of schools that were set up around the civil rights movements in the 1970s, um, particularly, and we all hear about like the kind of um, the arty ones, but we don't always hear about the ones like um, uh, the, the survival schools of the American Indian movement. Um, which were really uh, incredible kinds of spaces for decolonizing um, knowledge production, decolonizing schools. Um, and within the American Indian movement, uh, and I first learned about these actually through Jimmy Durham, who was brought up earlier as an artist, and he told me that um, this was the way that we they kind of dealt with education in the movement. Students couldn't survive, um, generally speaking, in mainstream schools because of the degree of racism around indigenous issues. Um, they produced uh, prisoners, in fact, at Attica who were involved in the um, in the uh, in the um, riots at Attica were very in, very informed by that process and became sort of radical pedagogues, leaving the prison and going back into their communities um, and teaching survival a by way of cultural survival. So there was like an act of genocide and still is in North America around indigenous people, but also um, also survival in terms of day to day survival. So they taught people how to pickpocket. They taught them how to like defend land. They taught them how to kind of forage for food in dumpsters if they needed to. You know, there's like a bunch of kind of survival strategies that were being taught alongside the cultural, um, cultural survival. And I think, um, again, you know, like that kind of motif um, or that kind of importance of thinking about how we actually live, um, you know, in relation to the analysis that we're producing. Um, and so this is Heart of the Earth School. This is the longest standing um, uh, survival school, which was still around um, in the in the um, 80s or in the ni or sorry, in 2008. I think it's still around now. I haven't checked, but um, and then also other um, other schools like the Highlander Folk School, which is probably more famous than the survival schools. Um, which was in Appalachia, so in the mountains uh, in Appalachia, and was, um, you know, a, a fairly small space, but basically, you know, people like Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, you know, and all of the kind of people who are on the on the ground organizers who are completely uncredited within the civil rights movement often pass through the Highlander. Um, to kind of learn uh, together about a um, to, to kind of um, hone in their analysis, but also to live the reality of desegregation. So it was like a place to um, to go and sort of live another way in order to understand what was being fought for in the civil rights movement. And so it was sort of out of the way of the of the day to day of the social movements, but was also um, a really significant kind of space for organizing and then infusing social movements around civil rights, and. Um, one of the theorists of, of the Highlander School um, talks about them as being movement halfway houses. So they were sort of somewhere between the movement and a sort of school that was just sitting on its own as a progressive education center. And so I've sort of thought um, about what are the sort of halfway houses of our social movements now. You know, like it's a question that I'm thinking about. And when we were making the radical education workbook, we were really thinking about ourselves, I think, in that sense of, of being a halfway house, a place to kind of analyze and try and understand and also live another set of realities that we could take into the movements that we're a part of. Um, and more recently, again, thinking about how do you do this in terms of art galleries, and I'm increasingly... Um, I should say, like, um, pessimistic about that, <laughs> about trying to link these practices 
to um, mainstream cultural institutions. But um, a more recent experience for me was um, working in a gallery in the sort of Midlands of England called Nottingham Contemporary. And it's a different kind of gallery than the Serpentine, which I was describing before, because the Serpentine is literally in the epicenter of wealth in London. And, um, you know, people like Michael Bloomberg are on the board of directors. So it's like a power center and it's quite absurd and almost... Um, yeah, macabre, I think, in the way that it performs its well. Um, but a uh, place like Nottingham Contemporary is almost entirely government funded. It's in a city that's predominantly, that's one of the poorest cities in England, has one of the lowest employment and lowest achievement levels in education, all of that. And also has a really long history of self-organized worker education. So um, has like a very uh, strong history of grassroots activism. And in Nottingham, um, we were, I was involved in the gallery as the public program person and started to work with activists who were involved in anti-racism work again. And, um, and they were interested in setting up a Black Lives Matter chapter, the first one in the UK um, in Nottingham and set up a kind of conference, but had a community, big community meeting off the back of the conference. So they were really smart organizers because they thought, okay, we're getting all these people in all over from all over the US. They're gonna talk about Black Lives Matter. And then we're going to have a community meeting and assembly the day after to talk about what we would do in the UK if we wanted to have this. And so that sparked uh, at the Black Lives Matter chapter in Nottingham. And, and in the UK in general. And um, it also provoked a lot of serious questions also about the gallery's involvement. And again, um, issues of reproduction came up um, consistently. So our role was not to produce events for Black Lives Matter. It was to sort of step back and kind of give space um, for whatever people wanted to do. For example, like designing actions um, or going preparing for court or developing events. Um, but also we were, we, we had to, one of the main supports that we had to negotiate was the, was childcare and that the group just needed uh, childcare to be able to organize because um, they just, there wasn't a lot of childcare uh, options available and so you know our budgets again went from like event production around exciting issues to paying for childcare, food and other kind of enabling aspects these things sound really small and i'm talking about them um as if they are very big because i think they are and i think um these kinds of reshaping reshapings are really um what what emancipatory pedagogy has to do if it's going to engage in these kinds of institutions i don't think the institution should be left untouched um, and I think that that can be, you know, deeply, deeply problematic when they are. Um, so the question is, could cultural organizations be movement halfway houses? Maybe they already are here. And in other parts of the world, I know they can function in that way. But I also know that there's an increasing polarization between what these cultural institutions are aligned with in terms of global finance um, and sort of um, a kind of global art market elite and the communities in which they're situated. So, so the question is, could cultural organizations be halfway houses? When are they? Could they provide or be spaces in which people can self-organize the survival schools? Um, and would we need to, um, and I think we would, need to make a movement to wrench back public cultural resources from the regimes that valorize overproduction um, and exhaustion over care? Um, so we, you know, so how are we, how do we do that? And Freire was really interesting, I think, in, in his reflections on um, when he was doing the um, pedagogy work in Guinea-Bissau and sort of said, you know, they're, we're making these kind of post-liberation schools and um, they're really important and they're sort of like people's universities. They need to operate as people's universities, but they will not function as emancipatory education unless the whole of the society actually change. You know, we have to change everything. The, the institution of the school cannot sit on its own. It needs to be part of movements that are, that are integrated and that's what um, actual emancipatory pedagogy does it explodes the paradigms in which they're situated so on that note i'll end and uh, see if we can have a discussion about that yeah thank you Does anyone have a question or a comment? 
Yeah. Um, Pablo, I don't have a thing just in case we want to speak Italian. Um, yeah. Oh, in English? Oh, yeah, in English, yeah. Uh, I have um, a question about uh, the first project you, you made with Serpentine mm -hmm. and the migrants group and mm -hmm. theater. Mm -hmm. um, how did you do this process of making the decision of sharing the budget with mm -hmm. them? Mm -hmm. And how... Yeah, what, what was... Um, you had a pedagogical support to or tool to, to, mm -hmm. to create that and mm -hmm. make it possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the piece that we made um, together was, um, uh, is, it's an activity or a sort of um, game in Augusto Boal's um, Theater of the Oppressed. Um, and it was a game where uh, basically you sort of improvise a scenario where there's a uh, kind of diplomatic event where there's a lot of very wealthy people having their, you know, cocktail party. And the workers spike their drinks with draw, with LSD, and you improvise what the situation would what situation would happen if you un if you released all of those roles. And so you go on improvising it for like an hour of just sort of unpacking all of those <laughs> kinds of relations, and this kind of um, being you know this kind of um, discussion or this kind of activity. We did quite a long debriefing on it, and that was when the discussion about the changing of um, of the roles within the group started to come up in a much more profound way. In many ways, it couldn't have started at the beginning because we were all sort of finding each other, and the only part, you know, there wasn't a co kind of collective in the beginning of the project. It really was a workshop, um, and and this was this activity or theatrical activity, pedagogical activity kind of pushed the discussion to become more of a collective and to collectivize sort of things like budgets and, um, and the process of production. So it wasn't only about that, it was also about how would, um, how would people be trained in order that they could be trainers rather than people who were participants. You know, there were a number of other things that came out of that, but it was somehow embodying and playing this role where the workers actually sort of fight back and but also like undo almost sensibly undo the relations between um the rule the ruling class and and the workers you know in a more in the most blunt <laughs> the blunt configuration but um and yeah so a lot came out through that process and a lot was unpacked in it so that was that was the device in terms of a pedagogical device for doing open budgeting we didn't have one there are people who have developed tools i know um, for that are more pedagogical tools. We literally sat with a spreadsheet and looked at the money and talked about it and decided where to reallocate funds. You know, it was very basic, but I think more could be done around, around that. And, and I think, I think here, and also, um, I know that of a group that does open budgeting with it, the entire, um, for, for a time, the Queens Museum in New York had an open budgeting process with its education programs in the community and developed some kind of pedagogical devices around that. So that would be a place to look for something more sophisticated than sitting around an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No problem. I wanted to ask if you can um, talk a little bit more about this experience of the open budget, for example, mm. or, or a participatory budget, and then the um, like safe distance that you can keep from like the main mm -hmm. institutions, mm -hmm. headquarters, and mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. sometimes education related programming or public programming has the luck of being less visible mm -hmm. in relation to other mm -hmm. practices, visibility within mm -hmm. museum institutions specifically, mm -hmm. and then that allows for things to happen, but mm -hmm. then um, Those things are marginalized. Yeah. it's also easily marketed as mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. like you were talking about all the way before. So how, as a worker within those conditions, mm -hmm. um, both pushing the limits and negotiating mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I know there's not a way to do it right, and there's <laughs> yeah. not a not a contradictionless mm -hmm. way for that to happen. But mm -hmm. in like the way you were inviting the Q and A session to open up a little bit about that, mm -hmm. I think it would be mm -hmm. without it becoming you know right or wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. How, mm -hmm. yeah, how to reflect on that? Like, mm 
-hmm. transit, mm -hmm. that it's at moments more optimistically mm -hmm. um, <laughs> occupiable mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. terms of transforming and mm -hmm. at others mm -hmm. really harsh. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you've touched on a number of answers to that question, <laughs> I think also, which is, um, you know, there are moments when there's more openness for that kind of work than, than others. You know, there was a moment, for example, at the Serpentine where it was really not possible to do this kind of work um, on the same level. But also I think there's, a, there's this dynamic between protection, like trying to protect spaces like that, and then also protecting it to the point of not implicating the institution at all. And I think it's a really fine line and it's really difficult. And it's probably why I'm feeling less comfortable with the, the kind of parasitic kind of work or whatever of education departments right now um but you know on the one hand um these processes take time and they completely do not conform with anything that the institutions generally um you know their general modus operandi and there's a lot of like just stuff that has to take place like you have to figure out how to get the money out of the organization if the money is only paid to artists and that's the only way in which money can leave and it can't go to community members especially if they don't have papers then how are you going to do that you know so there's like really like basic logistical kind of technical stuff that you have to figure out um, and then on the other hand you're so busy doing that and protecting everybody from the kind of um, paradigm of, of the institution um, then sometimes it just has no resonance there. And so, the, I mean, with the Edgware Road Project or the Center for Possible Studies, we had the, we had like six or seven years. So we were, you know, we had t some time to develop some of these strategies and then other times where we, you know, for example, used the analysis we were making with the, um, with the theater group to then resurrect the trade union in the gallery and start to, uh, to start to fight for different kinds of conditions for workers within the gallery. So, you know, sometimes we would sort of expose what we were doing in order that it would have a, a resonance of some kind. But again, like never without relationship with social movements who could also apply pressure from the outside um, rather than strictly it being a couple of employees who are risking their jobs or whatever. So, so it's like a sort of complicated set of relations I think like there needs to be um but it's also that sort of insertion of of this kind of work within um social within social movement processes like without that that doesn't have much force behind it and um then can't sort of make fights or claims within the sector and uh, I don't think we quite got there with what we were doing on the Edgeware Road but there were moments you know we did change some policies at the gallery as well as changing some ways of working so yeah, but it's quite modest. <laughs> the change is like, you know, it would, uh, but we, we learned quite a lot so um, about how to, how to do that kind of work. And, and, and each of us, I think, who is involved takes that into other circumstances. So um, I don't know if that answers. You might have some su suggestions too, Sophia, because I know you've been in similar navigational <laughs> no, but conundrums. The, then the other part, I don't think you can pair all of the living, con I think there's the living conditions of where the work takes place and then mm -hmm. of different workers within mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. institution. And yeah. there's also um, the question about self-care and your own living conditions, which mm -hmm. are of course privileged in relation to mm -hmm. people you might be working with also mm -hmm. and participants and mm -hmm. so not put in the same mm -hmm. level, but mm -hmm. there's that aspect mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which is, I mean, that was the, there was a kind of liberatory moment when all of that got laid out and got articulated and described and uh, where we even looked at funding applications and said, like, this is how you were narrated to get the money, you know, like, what do you think about that language that's being used? And, and we could start to unpack that. And I think, um, you know, those are, those are the, that's the frame, you know, and a lot of the time people have no idea under what auspices they've entered into a project like this and they've had no agency in, in redefining it or describing it in their own terms. So again, the naming thing <laughs> comes up there. Yeah. Okay. No, it doesn't sound like that. <laughs>
I don't know if it was just my reading of your tone of voice, but um, there see when you spoke about like some kind of skepticism coming in specifically around this Nottingham program, which actually seemed within what you showed the most sort of mm -hmm. coherent. So mm -hmm. I'm very mm -hmm. curious to mm -hmm. hear more about that process. Yeah, I was less skeptical about that process. It was the least, the one I was the least skeptical about, I would say. And um, uh, although the contradictions are still quite huge. And one of the things I didn't talk about was the fact that we were doing this work um, instigated an investigation into the practices of decolonization and racism within the organization. And so um, the activists we worked with said, look, we don't really want to do this work here unless you've undertaken a sort of, um, you know, self-investigation on your own practices. And so through that, we commissioned some research and that research is not easy. Um, to conduct and, and it's in its sort of first year right now and it's been quite challenging for people to actually reflect on those dynamics in the organization. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm not necessarily skeptical in that circumstance. I'm very, um, like, excited by it, but it's huge amounts of work, actually, <laughs> and, and it's very um, fragile and very slow and, and yeah, just difficult. So... Um, I think that's the work that needs doing. Um, uh, but, you know, places places more like uh, the Serpentine that I feel pretty skeptical about. I just, I really am not sure that, um, yeah, I still think amazing things happen there, but I just think until, like, boards of trustees look a little bit different than, um, you know, literally they, like, have to clear the gallery when the head of the board of trustees comes in because he doesn't want to see the public, you know. Those kinds of situations, I think, are ones that are incredibly compromised and difficult to wrench back into a sort of, um, agenda around uh, around this kind of stuff, but yeah, and also treat the employees who try to do it with, with you know a kind of um, violence that's very hard for them to bear. So, yeah. It's a change of subject, but yeah. I I was um, I went to a freinet school from <laughs> elementary school to mm -hmm. junior high. Mm -hmm because in the community it was discussed whether to do homeschooling, mm -hmm. but then we had different ages and somehow we ended up, the, the parents mm -hmm. found that this school was more resonant to With the kind of life at the community, so, mm -hmm. and it was very, very lucky find, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd never thought I haven't done like a formal research of the Freinet pedagogy, but mm -hmm. it, I see how it is present in what I do, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. and the way I understand learning and sharing and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was of the things that some of the tools that you described of the of the texto libre mm -hmm. of the free text mm -hmm. and the libro de vida. Mm -hmm. There was also another one that mm -hmm. was. Um, that the Diario de Vida, mm -hmm. there, besides the personal one, mm -hmm. there was one that was shared social, yeah. in each mm -hmm. group and it was passed on every week to mm -hmm. someone in the group. Mm -hmm. And in the assemblies, which happened mm -hmm. once a week mm -hmm. for an hour, mm -hmm. um, which were the councils that you were referring to, they, mm -hmm. they were read out loud and it mm -hmm. was a really, really mm -hmm. great mm -hmm. uh, way of going back to narrating a process, but it was really free. So it was mm -hmm. everything from what you did in the afternoon and where yeah. you went on vacations to what we, yeah. what happened at school yeah. to yeah. Um, fictional writing and mm -hmm. a number of things. Mm -hmm. and, there, um, and there was another thing that happened, at least in the school I went to, that was that the space in terms of composition was changed over the term. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that sometimes we were sitting around the table in teams of six, mm -hmm. sometimes in pairs and sometimes in larger teams and mm -hmm. sometimes one on one. And mm -hmm. this changed a lot over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And that allowed, mm -hmm. plus a very clear emphasis on teamwork, yeah. for these gender divisions that you were talking about to yeah. just not Mm -hmm. happen in that way like mm -hmm. everything was done by teams mm -hmm. whether it was an assembly and like in the collective of the group yeah or and there was also like individual processes and mm -hmm. very based on expressive and creative practices mm -hmm. and ways of opening and sharing mm -hmm. that freely and mm -hmm. and um 
Yeah, so I was, I had some of my teachers were part of the Mujeres en Lucha por la Democracia, mm -hmm. which was a, like a movement in the 80s in mm -hmm. Cuernavaca, like mm -hmm. a small part of the Democratic Revolutionary Party, which was called that way. And, and there was a discussion about doing things equally mm -hmm. that I didn't recognize as mm -hmm. a like explicitly feminist, mm -hmm. but it was clearly present mm -hmm. in the way that mm -hmm. things were discussed mm -hmm. in terms of solidarity and teamwork and collective organization. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was really nice to mm -hmm. resonate with what mm -hmm. you were yeah. sharing on that. Um, yeah, and the, I mean, the tools, I mean, the techniques around Fran, I mean, they go on, there's just pamphlets and pamphlets, like hundreds of them on the different kinds of techniques that, that you use to create kind of collective learning environments. So, and this thing from the, the individual to the group, to the large group, to the small group, I mean, it's like very intentional. And one of the things that they say is that um, the individual can't be created without, uh, cannot kind of exist and cannot exist as free without gr the group work, you know, the group work is what produces um, the sort of free individual. So and it's sort of, um, they're constantly sort of playing with these different modes of articulation, which I think is really interesting in terms of thinking about like arts pedagogy, for example, which predominantly, at least in the UK, is still very much <laughs> focused on individual production, achievement, talent, you know, um, that these kinds of um, the undoing of these kinds of um, modes of understanding education, I think, are is, there's still loads of work to, to be done, and there's also l so many kinds of basic strategies um, in those documents that kind of share that with you. So, yeah. Pues si no hay más preguntas pasamos a, a la siguiente. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Thank you.